Okay, we are finishing Hilchas Tshuva. No, we aren't. We've been reading through it, skimming through it, you know, yeah. saying things here and there. <laughs> the Roman was infinitely deep, and it's like, okay, enough commercials. Now, um, we mentioned yesterday, Rama brings a famous, famous Gemara. The Olam Yasuk Odom, his gears is Betora. Uh, a person should occupy himself with Torah, even not Lishma. And Lishma means out of love of the creator of the world who commanded it. If you can't bring yourself to do it in that pure way, do it anyway. Because if you do it in an impure way, you will come to do it in a pure way. And we had two problems with that. Number one, there seem to be many obvious counterexamples. There are professors of Jewish studies in universities who teach Torah their whole lives, and they remain non-religious, and they die non-religious. They, they never change. That seems to be a simple counterexample to the, to the principle. And second of all, uh, um, intuitively and from one's experience, if you do something and get a reward, and you do it for over a period of time, and every time you do it, you get a reward, why would anyone dream that you will come to a point where you just somehow outgrow your need for the reward and come to do it for its own sake? Why would you dream of such a thing? Well, what element of human nature would lead you to expect such a thing? So I worked on these problems for a long time. The first problem is an essay of Dessler, which explains it. And even that, I didn't get right the first time. And then it took me a while to get it, but I'll just give you the, the bottom line. It says in Rabbi Zosalanter. First of all, to whom is this dictum addressed? Who is the Gemara talking to? It's talking to a person who will do what the Gemara says, who believes in it, who, who takes it seriously. He's a person who believes that there is a mitzvah to do this and that the best way to do it is to do it lishma. It's just that he's not on the level of doing it lishma. So listen carefully. It means he already wants to do it lishma. Anyone who knows that the creator of the universe commanded you to do this knows that it's something that it's important to do, it's right to do, you have an obligation to do it, and therefore he already wants to do it this way. He already has a lishma desire to do it. It's just that. That desire isn't enough to enable him to, to consistently make the right decision because he has other desires also like any normal human being, and some of the desires are for comfort, and some of the desires are for pleasure, and some of the desires are for money, and they get in the way. So, he's in, he starts off in a religious dilemma. I know what ought to be done, and I'm not doing it. So then, the Gemara is saying, add to, you're already present, kavana, Intention, I say kavana, that's the wrong word, sorry. Your motivation to do it lishma, add to it some private benefit so that the combination of the two motivations will be enough for you to decide to do it. And if you do it that way, you'll come to outgrow your need for the additional private motivation and you'll come to do it only for the pure motivation. I will give you an example. Ruve knows the minions at 7.30. He sets his alarm for 7 o'clock. She get up, get dressed, go to the minion. Ah, but his alarm clock has a snooze button. <laughs> 7 o'clock, and it's ringing. Bang, another 15 minutes. Bang, another 15 minutes. He gets out of bed at 8.30. You know, he misses the minion. Why did he set his alarm? Why did he bother to set his alarm? Because he knows he's, he belongs there. And he wants to be there. But he's lazy. And because he's lazy, doesn't always do what the right thing is to do. 
Now, I give him a suggestion. He comes to me, he trusts me for some unaccountable reason. And I tell him, make a chavrusa with Shimon for 7.20, 10 minutes beforehand. Okay. Okay. Now the alarm is set for 6.50. Not 7, but 6.50. Could you imagine? Before 7 o'clock, 6.50. And it rings at 650, it's, where's that snooze button? Wait a minute. If I go back to sleep, Shimon's gonna be there. He's gonna be waiting for me. I'm not gonna show up. How can I face him? I can't do that. So, gritting my teeth, I drag myself out of bed, or Ruven does, and he goes down to, to, uh, to be there at 720 and dives at 730. Quiz time, why is he getting out of bed? No! Wrong answer! The Chavrus is the wrong answer. Why is he getting out of bed? No! Wrong answer. Why is he getting out of bed? I said the answer twice already. Nobody got it. You're not paying attention. There are two motivations working together. He added the selfish motivation to the already in place Motivation to do it, Lishma, and the two of them together are what's getting him out of his bed. That's what I said he was doing. He's adding the second one so the two together would enable him to make the right decision. It's not true that the embarrassment's getting out of bed. It's embarrassment plus the desire to do it for its own sake, to do it out of love of the Creator who commanded it. It's the two together. And this is what Rishon Salanter is saying. That since he had the desire to do it, Lishma, to start with, and not only that, but the desire to do it the Shema is what motivated him to set up the Chavrusa, to put the selfish motivation in place. That because he wanted to do what the, the, desire, the, the desire for the Lishma would, would have had him do, and he's not doing it. Then under those conditions, he will be able to uh, ex, uh, expect that he'll, he'll outgrow the need for the, for the one, and, not, and, and, uh, and he'll be able to do it only the Shema. That answers the question about the professors. Because they don't recognize the obligation in the first place. They don't start with the desire to do it, lishma, And the, the dictum in the Talmud is not describing them. Not describing them. The dictum in the, in the Talmud is an instruction. It's telling you what to do. It's not a prediction. It's not a scientific theory. It's an instruction. A person who listens to the instruction and follows it the instruction will produce the results that it, that, it, uh, that it says. That's the answer to the first question. You wanted to ask a question? No? Okay. Yeah. I was wondering really why can't he just be motivated by the first need? Maybe like he wants to, like, you know, the example with the Rosh Hashiva who said, I wake up for a cup of coffee. I don't do it for a job. Why can't you be motivated? No one says you can't be. I'm talking about a person who isn't. And he wants to overcome the resistance. Now, most people have uh, a tremendous number of different motivations, and they often conflict with one another. We lead conflicted lives. We have to make free decisions. And when there is a motivation against doing what the Torah wants, the decision is a difficult decision. And uh, often the result is at least that you're not consistent in doing what the Torah wants. So the Gemara is telling you, add in a selfish motivation, and in that way you'll make the decision easier because you'll have more going in favor of doing the right thing. Right? That's, that's, yeah. So is it better to have, um, to be almost like, I guess, doubly motivated, to be motivated for a selfish reason and also a reason to serve God, or just to be motivated to, by a reason to serve God? Or are they the same? No. We, we said yesterday and the day before, the Rambam says that the, the, on, the highest service of God is where you're only motivated by love. You asked about, about the year, about awe. I said, even that has to be, has to be put on the side. The only motivation should be, he says, rock me, rock me up, rock me up, just, just, just out of love. But, but, that. so, but, but, but that's, that's the ideal. Here, the word is saying that, uh, that if you aren't on that ideal level, and you want to get to that ideal level, so then this is, this is the way to do it. And by the way, uh, there's a sefer called Kochav Yitzchak, which I never opened, but if Desta quotes it, I don't want to pretend that I did things I didn't do. Uh, and and he, he says, notice what the Gemara says, the Gemara says, Le'olam, always a person should engage selfish motivation to add to his motivation to do it out of, out of love. 
so that he'll be able to get to him. He's, uh, isn't the shortcut. If you think you went straight to the Lishma, you're fooling yourself. You're not, you're, you're not honest with what you, what's really going on. So it's, a, it's, a, it's like a, a, a psychological chok, a, a law that has to, has to be done this way. Okay, but now I asked another question, and that, why would I think that it would work this way? Of course, the Gemara could be telling me that's divine providence, and, and uh, it's a guarantee. But I think, I think there's more to say than that. And I'll give you an example from my own experience. Just let me, let me explain another thing. Um, a person learns to play a musical instrument. Uh, I played the flute, but let's take a violin, you know. So you get little kids, like seven years old, they have quarter violins. They're, they're tiny. And he, he starts to play, and he's practicing, you know. Um, let, me, let me let you in on, a, a, on an obvious fact, right? When that kid picks up the violin and plays, it's awful. It's awful. It's just noise. It's terrible. And not only do you know it, but he knows it. And he knows that you know it. And you know that he knows that you know it. And every, there's nobody being fooled here. This is not Beethoven. This is awful. And for a year, it's awful. It sounds terrible. Why would a kid do something that sounds awful? Because you pay him off. That's why. Because you use an external, you know, the carrot and stick. Your Jewish parent, you know, the 11th commandment, <laughs> thou shalt play the violin. <laughs> <laughs> we command it for my children. <laughs> That's the one we wrote for, we wrote for you. you know, thou shalt play the violin, whether I play it or not. Um, so you use an external inducement, because otherwise you won't do it. But after a while, it begins to sound like music. After a while, he's making music. Making music carries itself. You don't have to pay someone off in money or in candy or in trips or anything to make music. It's thrilling to make music. I speak as someone who performed. I performed many times. So because there's something in the deep psyche of the person that responds to music. By the way, I don't think anybody knows how this works. If you do exercise, serious exercise, you know very well. You have much more strength and endurance if you do it to music. It just somehow galvanizes inner, inner strength. There are people who have trouble controlling their mu muscles. I don't know what they official medical term is, but the, the common term is they have, they're, they're spastic, right? Some of them, if you play music, they, they can dance beautifully, dance with perfect coordination because of music. Something's going on that music touches a part of the person that we don't, I don't think we really understand how and why it works. Okay, so now that means that at a certain point, although he started playing the violin because of the external inducements, he will outgrow them because it'll become internally motivated. Because internally, he, he appreciates the beauty of what he's doing. Now, I think the same thing's true for a Jew and mitzvot. The same creator that created the world and created the Jew with his soul created the mitzvot. They are designed to fit hand in glove. Only when you're clumsy, when you don't have the, the performance under control, you know, it's like a musician has to think of how he's moving his fingers. He shouldn't perform. Not he's thinking about his fingers, he shouldn't perform. It's got to become habitual. It's got to flow out of him without any thought whatsoever. He's got to be thinking about emphasis and subtlety and nuances. So a person who starts off doing mitzvahs, it's so clumsy and worry about pronouncing the words, you know, <laughs> let alone what the words mean. So it's going to take time. Furthermore, if he doesn't know why he's doing it, doesn't know the, the meaning in the mitzvah, listen carefully, the meaning in the mitzvah. I didn't say God's reason for commanding it. We're not reading God's mind. But the mitzvah is not just move your fingers and legs and arms in a certain way. The mitzvah embodies a meaning that the Baruch Hu revealed to us. This is the meaning in the mitzvah that you're doing. So your mind should be on, on line also, not just your arms and legs. When you get to that point, then the motivation for doing the mitzvah takes over and you don't need the external inducements anymore. So I think we do have an explanation as to why we could expect that when a person starts off with a kavana, the, the motivation to do it, lishma. The word kavana is not right. Well, the, the, the motivation to do it, lishma. And isn't doing it consistently and adds in a selfish motivation that he will outgrow the selfish motivation because the, the shama, the soul, will naturally be inspired by the performance 
And that being the case, it'll carry itself. Yeah. So are there times where like adding a selfish motivation would be bad? Such as like, let's say someone could technically be motivated to do an action in and of itself for the purpose of, let's say, serving God, but they doubt themselves and they say, you know, I'm going to reward myself here just to do this action. But really, they would do it without the reward. They just don't, they don't know about that, that, they don't know about that aspect of themselves. In other words, would adding, would ever adding this selfish motivation be, uh, be, be used as a crutch in some cases? I see. You're asking, I'm not sure how your, your question is related to what we said until now. The, I, the way I would un, uh, express it, um, this is exactly the use of a crutch. That's exactly what's being recommended. Is it ever bad to use that, though? Thank you. Well, you only use a crutch if you have a broken bone. You know, if your if your legs are healthy, you don't use a crutch. It'll hold, slow you down. It, it's 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 not only useless, but it's but it's actually detrimental. Now here, since the idea is to serve God with this pure lishma motivation, if you are already able to do that, why would you? Sully the waters, why would you? What well, if you doubt yourself? What if you don't know if you could actually do oh, it? Oh, right? so then, okay, so that means that you're in doubt as to whether you'll actually carry it out. Yeah. And this will guarantee that you carry it out? Yeah, I think that's fine. I think that's fine. It's appropriate to doubt yourself. It's appropriate to, to, uh, to, to ensure that, uh, that the mitzvah will be done. I, I think that's right. Yeah. If we consider Ahavat um, Hinam, Manifests to us, like the other way we consider Hashem that manifests through through Abad uh, You're asking whether God manifests Himself to us with what you're calling Avat Chidam, which I guess would mean love that hasn't been earned. Um, and I see how it's exactly related to what we've been saying up until now, but of course, all right, He created us. We didn't earn that. <laughs> So, of course, it's an expression of Amat Chinam. I don't know. Sorry, because I mean, what I'm seeing is that somehow the, the highest level is to, to, if that's the most um, shorish, like the source of, of, of our own, well. That's Ahamat Yeah. So, so maybe it's like the idea that we should emulate that same uh, expression. But we're, well, we're, where did Chinam come in here? We're talking about loving, the, we're, do, we're doing the command of the cre- out of love of the creator of the universe who commanded it. That's not Chinam. That's not for nothing. I recognize that he created the universe right. and then he commanded it. That's a gigantic fact. You know, Schiller should be well has a phrase, which I think is a very deep and uh, important phrase. There are certain facts that obligate. There are facts that obligate. When you, co- when you realize the, the fact, you are automatically under an obligation. Yeah, I know about human, I know about all that is, and I know also that he was very vague about that. The gigantic literature, and I know John Searle wrote a paper where he claimed that you can get an ought an, 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 an from an, uh, an is from an ought, an ought from an is. So uh, I, I'm, I'm just a like aficionados. Uh, we know the literature, but there are certain ideas that obligate. They obligate in and of themselves. William Frank and I had an example. If this button will blow up the planet, isn't that enough to motivate you not to do it? If you know it'll blow up the planet? It ought to be. And for a normal person, it would be. You can get an ought from it is. Anyway, so I, I, I don't th- see that the, the, what we're talking about here is chinam. It's not w- free. It's in recognition of an overwhelming fact which creates an obligation. I mean, the, the chinam seems to me more in the, in the, in the interpretation of, of, of the person. Because uh, it might be hard in, in, in more extreme scenarios to actually see the, the like, take out of, like, love God in the extreme scenarios. That's why I'm saying like Holocaust. it doesn't like I'm exp- like that. That's the moment like when you s- you see Hashem's love in an extreme scenario. So it's not that he's seeing Hashem's love. There you don't see Hashem's love. If you do, then it's not then it's not chinam again. So, no, no, it's not going to work. No, I, I I don't I don't see the word chinam playing any role here. Chinam means without obligation, without any reason, without any without any need, without any necessity, without any without any debt, without. 
All of that doesn't apply when you're talking about the creator of the universe. I don't think the word chinam works there. Well, perhaps the word chinam, no, but uh, so if to see Hashem's love in, in, in extreme scenarios. Yes. I mean, I'd say like perhaps that's like a, a, a real uh, challenge to see if you really love Hashem. That's, uh, that's the new idea now. To see Hashem's love. If I really love Hashem, then I will see Hashem's love in extreme scenarios. I don't see why. We spoke even about the case of the Chofetz Chaim, that somehow he said that uh, now he loves Hashem. Like, right. I mean, it, bring, it, it comes to my mind because uh, that scenario is just a terrible scenario. Yeah, but well, I told you what, what we hear in the name of the Chavetz Chaim at the funeral for his son is very difficult to, to take, to take uh, simplistically because if you do, he's going to be denying one of the mitzvahs of the Torah. And, and the Chavetz Chaim would not do that. So it can't be taken at face value. He said, he's supposed to have said, now I, I'm grateful for the fact that I can devote all my love to Hashem because before I also loved my son. And the problem with that, taking that statement of face value is, Hashem said you should love your son. So if he doesn't love his son, he's not doing what Hashem wants. He's got to love his son. So that can't be a failure. It can't be a compromise. It can't be a uh, substandard performance to love another Jew. It can't be, because Rocha wants you to do it. So then something's wrong with the way it's being understood. So I asked one time at Chacham, and he said, you're right. If you love your son the way a Kodesh Baruch wants you to love him, and I mentioned loving the fact that he has a soul, and that soul is an expression of God, and so on and so on, then it wouldn't be a problem. What he meant was, his love for his son was a selfish love. And that's why he competed with his, with his love for Hashem. You know, you could say that, I suppose. If you don't know it, it's very hard, I think, to, to impose upon the Chavz Chaim the idea that he has selfish love rather than, a, than, a, than a, an appropriate love. Maybe you were saying, I don't know. But, uh, it, it, the point is you cannot take it simply at face value because it's, it's, it, it's, an, it's an impossibility. It's just an impossibility. Yeah. No, no, sorry. Oh, okay, yeah. All right, let's... Uh, you have a question? No. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, now he says, Therefore, what we teach... This is the same thing we saw before. This <laughs> teach children and women and the general population of uneducated people. You don't teach them to serve Hashem. I'm sorry. We only teach them to serve Hashem out of Yira, fear, and in order to receive a reward. Because that's all they can relate to. That's all they can take. Until their, uh, their knowledge under, expands and they become wise with ex, uh, exceeding wisdom, then we reveal to them this secret, little by little, and we accustom them to the idea um, in, in pleasant ways until they understand it and appreciate it, and then they will serve f from love. And notice again that women are included here. The only, only difference between... Uh, they are classified with people whose education takes longer time because... They're not, not uh, so intensely educated from a young age. But no, there are no inherent uh, weaknesses in women that they can't reach the highest possible levels of divine service. Now, he says, it's a, th a well-known thing and clear that love of Hashem is... Um, It's not attached, tied to the heart of a person until he's continuously preoccupied with it, as we said. And he should abandon everything in the world other than it. As it says, with all your heart, with all your soul. Now, Remember what we said a few days ago. This, is, this can be very easily misunderstood. 
So then uh, go off to a cave and meditate. And that's, that's all you should do. And what about loving other Jews, which is a mitzvah, right? So as we said, the love of Hashem accompanies everything else. And it gives a certain, a certain understanding and dimension to everything else. And anything that you have in the world which, to which that dimension applies, and when you engage with that thing, the dimension will be part of the experience of, and, the, and the motivation, uh, then this, is, this instruction will not forbid it. It's only if it's something which takes you out of that context, then it's going to be forbidden. And the example that I like here is an example of physical pleasure um, because there are many sources that indicate that Kosh Baruch Hu wants us to have physical pleasure. Uh, when you make the blessing once a year on the trees, you say, Kosh created them, lahanos bahem bnei adam, to give people pleasure. And there's a Teisvis which says, Teisvis and Ketzim Mavarchim, which says the bracha that we make after most foods, we say barasa, he creates many souls and their necessities. And then the bracha goes on. Everything that you created to give life uh, uh, to, all, to, to all life. So we're giving thanks for two things, necessities and Everything that was created to give life. Tasha says, what are necessities? Bread and water. That's it. On bread and water you can live. That's all its necessities. Everything else he says is, the ta'anug ba'alma. It's just for pleasure. Meat and fruit and vegetables and cheese and wine and beer. It's all for pleasure. Kegon tapuchim, he says, like apples. Apples are for pleasure. Just for pleasure. Because Rokho created them all for pleasure. Nowhere in the Torah does it say a person has to exist just on bread and water. I know when you start your studies, sleep on the floor, okay, fine. But nowhere does it say that that's, that's a rule for, for people in general. So certainly, pleasure is not the enemy. Contrary, because Rafa wants us to have pleasure. Why? Why does he want us to have pleasure? Because pleasure, huh? Because pleasure is a way of connecting with it. If you understand that Akash Baruch is running the world and you have this item that gives you pleasure because he created it for you to have pleasure, the most minimal consciousness says, say thank you. So having the pleasure leads you to say thank you. And saying thank you means it puts you in touch with it. So you have two sources. When Rabbi Yudha Nasi died, he was very rich, Rabbi Yudha Nasi, and he says, I take an oath that I didn't have as much pleasure out of this world as my little figure. On the other hand, there's a Yerushalmi that says that when you get to the next world, they will ask you, you were in this and this situation, and you had an opportunity to have that and that pleasure, and you passed it by. Why? Why did you pass it by? Explain yourself. Justify yourself. Why did you pass it by? So it sounds like a, con a contradiction. And the answer that, that some give is that what he meant was, I didn't have a selfish pleasure that would cut me off from a Kodesh Baruch Hu, as much as my little finger. But of course, the pleasures that connect me to the Kodesh Baruch, of course I had those. It's another means of being connected. So when it says here that you should have, uh, abandon everything other than the love of God, it doesn't mean force everything out of your consciousness other than the love of God, but rather accept into your consciousness only those things that can be accompanied by and be an expression of love of God which includes love of other Jews, which includes love of mitzvahs, which includes uh, love of Torah, love of Torah learning. The brach we make up for Torah learning in the morning stresses that it should be pleasurable. What some of the say, I think it's the, uh, the um, first Sachat Shavar Rebbe, uh, uh, Avni Nezer, says, if you don't have pleasure out of Torah learning, you're not succeeding in really learning Torah the way it should be learned. You should have pleasure from it. So it's, it's not exclusive in the way that you might take it at, at first glance. It only means something which would, be, would contradict and shut out that dimension of love of God. That's, that's what's being uh, re rejected. Is the yeah. right, is the right uh, method, methodology to think Hashem has given me this opportunity to enjoy this pleasure, physical pleasure, Hashem, then everything is permissible.
permissible and okay, and that's the wow. intended purpose of this pleasure. Well, uh, to say that be, if I'm going to use the pleasure to connect to Hashem, everything's permissible. As long as the pr- pleasure is permissible. Oh, okay, thanks, okay. that's very important. <laughs> as long as the pleasure, uh, the pleasure is in, in and of itself, you know, uh, I, uh, if I take your sandwich and I eat it and enjoy it, I'll definitely thank Hashem for your sandwich, and I'll, you know, be, but, you know, I can't steal in order to have that pleasure. So, yeah, that's a very important qualification. But yes, yes, I think that's right. That's right. Now, of course, you have to talk about secondary effects. You could become addicted to the pleasure, and then it will lead to situations in which the pleasures won't, won't, won't be linked to Hashem. And to, but otherwise, yes, absolutely. Hare, what is the nature of Olam Abba, which is the purpose of all existence? That's to say, it's God's purpose. That we should, Olam Abba is pleasure. Olam Abba is pleasure. And that's really quite a gigantic re, uh, remark. Look at the first chapter, The Way of, way of God. Uh, Ramchal starts with tov and benefit, and in the end he ends with pleasure. Uh, if a good Baruch wants us to have that, and that's the ideal state of existence, there can't be anything wrong with having pleasure. Can't be. Yeah. During the act of having the pleasure, do we have to have the kavana or am I only doing this for the sake of... Well, I'm not quite sure of your question. You're, you're asking, is it necessary in order to have the pleasure? Say, is it enough before and afterwards? Oh, you mean during the time? No, it doesn't have to be continuous. Yeah. I remember asking this of my Rebbe Zatzal, and he said, you make a bracha beforehand, make a bracha afterwards, fine. Like, I know people during the Shabbos too, especially big chassidish rabbi, and they say, oh, Shabbos kodesh. Yes, uh, to, but that doesn't mean you have to. That means that they, who are on a very high spiritual level, did that to express the position that they were accomplishing. It doesn't mean everyone has to. And, and I, I, what I remember seeing it wasn't over and over and over and over again. It was from time to time. Um, okay, so let's see. Now there's a problem with the text here. So then he says, well, I'm skipping uh, three words because the text is not, is not clear. The way it is. That's how you relate to Kodesh Baruch Hu, that's how you get into the world to come. Uh, with the knowledge and love that you have of a Kodesh Baruch Hu. Now, there's a deep idea here, which um, I, I think it, the Ramam doesn't stress it because I think it's probably obvious for him, but it's, it's, it's worth talking about. And that is, love requires understanding. You can't love an unknown can't love an ex. You can be afraid of an ex. Something's coming, I don't know what it will do. And you think of the thing, very things it might do, and you take precautions, and you might try to prevent it because you don't know what it will do. You can be afraid of something. You could stand in awe of something which you don't understand because you see a little bit, and then you know that behind that little bit is a gigantic greater reality, which you don't uh, appreciate. And you say, okay, the little bit that I see is very impressive, but uh, the gigantic reality behind it is sort of like inviting Einstein to uh, come and speak to 10-year-olds, to inspire them to learn physics. So he tells them a few experiments, a few ideas. Now they know the guy's world famous. They know he won the Nobel Prize. So the clever ones among the 10-year-olds are figuring out, no, we're not getting his whole brain today. No, certainly not. But what he told us is very impressive. And if he's gigantically beyond that, in a way that we can't really understand, that he must be something really very special. So you can be overawed by something that you don't really understand. But you can't love that way. Love requires identification. Love requires sharing. Love requires um, cooperation. Love requires... um, uh, the word, not cooperation, but we partnership. Um, and that you can only do if you have understanding. That's why, this is uh, just a footnote to a long discussion, that's why when God told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, and if you examine the, the nature of the, of the test, you'll see that Abraham could not understand what was going on. Because God expressed himself to Abraham in contradictory terms. He said to him that 
your son, Isaac, will be your continuation. At this point in his life, Isaac has no children. And God is now saying to him to sacrifice him. To the extent that the Drushes Aran and the Shlop both say that he would have been within his rights not to sacrifice him. He could have said to God, look, you told me A and B. A and B cannot both be done. So I have to choose one. I chose this one. I chose what you said, that he'll be your continuation. And therefore, slaughtering him is not on the, is, is not on the table. And he would have been perfectly justified. He would not have been making any mistake. That's why the Ran says that the verse says, please. The Ran says something very deep. He says, God is saying to Abraham, I can't command you. I can't command you. Because even if I tell you, do it, you're, I'm on record telling you not to do it, so it can't be a command. It can't really obligate you. That's why I'm saying, please, I'm asking you to go beyond uh, the nature of obligation. So now at this point, if Abraham asks, so what's going on here? What's the point? What's the purpose? What's the goal? What's being expressed here? Either way? Makes no difference whether I kill him or I don't kill him? Sacrifice him or don't sacrifice him? That's why it says, when he passes the test, now I know that you have all for me. It doesn't say, now I know that you love me. It says, now I know that you have all for me. Because you are able to do it without understanding. It means that love alone will not carry you through this test. You have to be able to stand back and say, this is overwhelmingly greater than I am, and even if I don't understand it, I have to do it. That's not out of love. Not out of love alone. Love can't carry you to do that. Yeah, the word Soto says that the, the year it came from Alpha. I understand that. Okay. So I think that uh, when the Rambam says here that knowledge and love are intrinsically related to one another, on the surface he's making a very uh, important point that we all appreciate. You cannot love an unknown. And therefore, let me make one more remark and I'll take your question. In the second chapter of the fu Fundamentals of Torah, at the very beginning, he says, um, it is a mitzvah to love and have awe for the Creator. As one verse says, you should love Him. And another verse says, you should stand in awe of Him. How is the way to loving Him and having awe for Him? When a person investigates God's actions, not natural world. We're not talking about scientists. He's not investigating nature. He's investigating God's actions. The words God's actions are part of the description of his state of mind, not an external pious description of, of nature. It's part of his state of mind. People got this wrong all the time. And every scientist, according to Romans, should be religious. No, that's not what he's saying. When a person investigates God's actions and his creations, which are wondrous, great, and he'll see his great wisdom, which is beyond comprehension and beyond end, immediately he will love and praise and exalt and desire, a great desire, to know this great being, this great being who's creating the world. And he quotes from Tuffet. So what brings him to love is his knowledge and understanding. And then, he says, when you act on this and you, and you learn more and you come closer, and then you begin to appreciate, you know, your mind shifts, its, it's frame shifts, and you think, who am I? This is what the Creator is, what little bit of the Creator that I see, so overwhelmingly great, and I'm what? Like they say, I can't imagine that a mere failure of antiseptic conditions, which allowed life to spontaneously uh, arise on this stony planet, should be interesting to a creator, right? And so you can't imagine it. That, that's true. You can't imagine it. So what? That doesn't make it false because you can't imagine it. The world doesn't have to obey your imaginations. Right? So um, then, he, th then he, he, he's, he's propelled backwards. Oh, well, what am I doing? Who am I, what am I relating to? And what place do I have here? That's where, that's where awe comes from. But the, the starting point is, is the knowledge, is the understanding. 
Uh, there's a lot more to say about it, but remembering that it's the actions of, a, of an agent, the creations of an agent, that's what he's saying at the end of the, uh, uh, of, of the tenth chapter, that it's that knowledge which is the bridge to him, and it's also what is expressed in, in your love for him, because without the knowledge, there's no such thing as love. Yeah. So would, you, would being motivated out of awe be a greater motivation than being motivated out of love in certain instances? Or could you be motivated out of awe, like in the case of Abraham? Um, okay, well, let me, we didn't say anything about greater. The idea of greater didn't come up. What we said is that love alone won't suffice under all circumstances. Doesn't make it greater. Doesn't make it greater. You know, as I say, do you communicate by, by computer? Yeah, but when you're deep sea diving and you have to send a message to the surface, there are pens that use waterproof ink and you actually write with them underwater. Don't take your computer down with you. <laughs> you, you, you will not communicate to the surface with your computer. Use the ballpoint pen with the waterproof ink. You know? <laughs> Yesterday you were talking about how eventually all your motivations for serving God would be out of love. Or maybe I misinterpreted you there. So, no, you didn't, you didn't interpret, misinterpret me there. Um, so let's see. That's a good question. All of us, Rash, the Rama says all should be out of love and only out of love. And you asked about awe, and I said, I agree with you that awe means should outgrow the need for awe as well. Hmm, there may be the more the, the, from Sota, which I quoted uh, just a moment ago under my breath. Maybe that's, maybe that's a help here. Because the Gemara and Sota, I didn't put that together. Maybe that's part of what the Gemara means. It says that Abraham's awe came out of his love. Now, um, there are several explanations of that idea. One is where the awe, year I told you, can mean fear or awe. And one explanation is to take it as fear. The awe is so, I'm teaching now, I'll call you back. Um, the, 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 the love is so precious that you develop a fear of losing it which is quite appropriate. And that fear, obviously, can only be developed after you have the love. So it is something which grows out of the love and is an appropriate accompaniment to the love. That doesn't make it greater. And now there might be things which are this kind of outgrowth and accompaniment to the love, which are what sustain you in circumstances where love without the outgrowth and the accompaniment would not sustain you. So it isn't that the love isn't being, isn't being used. It isn't that the love isn't there. But it's, and if this is just, if it's an outgrowth and, a, and, a, and, a, and an accompaniment, so then it can be seen as an expression of love also. Right? It's, just, it's not love as an expression of love. I'll, I'll give you an example. This you have in, in capitalistic sources all the time. When, when you see your child, your five-year-old, you're walking with him in the street, and the ball goes into the street, and, and he starts to chase after the ball. What do you do? Oh, my dear child, I love you. Please come back to your father. No! You grab him, you pull him back roughly, and you say to him, that's terrible. You must not ever do that. Where's the love? Goodness gracious. How severe can you be? Where's the love? The love is in the severity. I love you so much that I have to be severe with you. I don't want you to die. So that severity is really an expression of love. Even though it's quality isn't love, but it's an expression of love. It's a love that's motivating the severity. So I think that may be a way of, of answering the question. The question is a good question. I didn't think of it. So Abraham was still motivated by love then. But it's, it's, it's not, it, it's, how should I say it? You know, it's, we have this all the time. In, in Kabbalistic source, you have this all the time, where A has to operate, but the context in which it's found don't tolerate A's being identified. So therefore, it uses a shield or, a, or, a, or a, a, an external appearance of B, because that's what's not. For example, the child must not feel to his father. When the father your, j, uh, uh, drags him out of the street and yells at him not, not to run into the street, he mustn't feel towards his father the way he feels when his father gives him a lollipop. Because if that's the way he feels towards his father, it won't have the impression that it needs to make, that this is impossible, this cannot be done. The impression has to be a severe impression. Right? 
So it's motivated by love, but the quality of the interaction is not a loving quali- uh, interaction. If you didn't know the background, you think that the father was just uh, strict and severe. I mean, you don't see the love in, in it. But I think that's, uh, that may be the answer. But it's, uh, I, I should look it up. It's, it's a good question. How the Rambam would, would understand the, um, the, the Akedah under, under those uh, circumstances. And he writes about the Akedah. It's not that he didn't write about it, so he, he definitely has it in mind. Yeah. The Rambam, yeah, it's very interesting. The Rambam t- talks about developing the two of them. He starts the chapter with, the, with, with both of them, and he says, love comes first. Because what creates the awe is the knowledge. And something has to draw him to seek the knowledge. What draws him to seek the knowledge is what little knowledge he gets. And he's so uh, motivated and inspired by the knowledge that he gets, which is already a beginning expression of love, and then it all comes as a result of that shift in frame where he thinks, yes, but what am I doing? I'm growing myself close to that, you know. But of course, this is the process of development to perhaps uh, prevent uh, a couple of misunderstandings which were very popular a few decades ago. Uh, the Rambam does not describe this as the end of the process. Someone once criticized even the Rambam, in his mind, because he said, love and awe are both mitzvahs. And it shouldn't be that God would, get, would command two mitzvahs that are impossible to do together. And he read this Rambam as if it's like a pendulum. You know, you draw close, and then you go back, and draw close, and you go back, and your whole life is swinging like a pendulum. The Rambam doesn't say that. He says, what is the way to get there? The way to get there is through this process, and this process will have a pendulum effect, but no, no, nothing says it's going to go on like that forever. And you get to a point where both are entrenched, and you're in a, in a, uh, in a, in a, constant, uh, a constant frame. Anyway, that's the, the ultimate goal. Serve a Baruch Hu out of love. And again, I don't think Aristotle would have said that. <laughs> so that's...